good good evening, everybody. Welcome to this um, midweek worship, Encounters with Jesus. We're in our fifth week of the Lenten season, and I'm glad that you can join us for this time of worship as we pause during the middle of a busy week. I invite you to join me in this opening prayer. Let us pray. God of grace and Lord of love, our hearts unfold like flowers before you in praise and adoration. Rain down upon us the gift of your presence that we might know you, grow in you, and bear good fruit for your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We'll continue singing, adding one verse each week, the hymn, I Danced in the Morning. I danced in the morning when the world was begun, and I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun. And I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth and met the join me in this responsive litany of confession. Son of Mary, have mercy on us. Carpenter of Nazareth, have mercy on us. Healer of the sick, have mercy on us. Bringer of good news, have mercy on us. Savior of the poor, have mercy on us. Disturber of the mighty, have mercy on us. Contradictor of the smooth, have mercy on us. Destroyer of false religion, have mercy on us. You who moves towards Jerusalem, trailing hope and hell behind you, have mercy on us. You who calls us sister, mother, brother, friend, and who asks us to come with you, have mercy on us. Amen. I invite you to pray in silence for just a moment as we prepare to hear the good news of God's grace and forgiveness.
Friends, Jesus said, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. Throughout the season of Lent, each of our scripture passages has focused on an encounter with Jesus. And certainly one of our hopes and prayers is that as we hear these stories read and as we engage in a particular calling on a particular Wednesday, that we might ourselves encounter Jesus in his word, as well as in his spirit leading us as the followers of Jesus Christ. Tonight's reading comes as our other readings have from the Gospel of John. It is in, the, in that Gospel that we find some of the most extended narratives about encounters with Jesus. And tonight's story is part of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. And interestingly enough, sadly enough, ironically enough, it is the story of Jesus giving life, bringing Lazarus back from the dead, that seems to lead to the decision to put Jesus himself to death. It is the gift of life that seems to enrage those who are most against him. But before that actual calling out of Lazarus from the tomb, we find this passage as Jesus approaches the tomb of Lazarus. Listen now to the word of God as Jesus meets Martha and Mary after having heard that Lazarus has died. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and she met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are Messiah, the son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, Mary got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and she said to him, oh, I'm sorry. She said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly moved and disturbed in spirit. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Among the many features of this story of Jesus coming to the home of his friends, coming at a time of great loss, in the midst of all the details of this narrative, and we know from our other readings in John that John is full of details, details over which we are invited to pour, and to ponder, from which we are meant to find meaning and to better understand not just the story being told, but the theology that is being carried and heavy, heavily laden inside the vessel of story. In the midst of all the details in the story about Jesus and Mary and Martha, there's one that's easy to see, but perhaps easy to miss, or at least easy to gloss over. And that is this uh, 
ability of Martha to speak directly and bluntly to her friend, Jesus, and the ability of Mary and Martha to share with Jesus in bold and direct ways how they're feeling, as well as the hopes that they have lost in light of Lazarus' death, but then also the hope that they have in Jesus. And what do I mean by all of that? What I mean is this, when Jesus approaches Mary full of emotion, Martha full of emotion, approaches him and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She lays it right out at Jesus' feet. She doesn't blame Jesus, but she lifts up what she believes to be the truth that had the son of man, the Lord of life, had the Messiah been there, her brother would not have died. She's naming her anger and frustration, her sense of loss. And later on when Martha is weeping and when Jesus himself is, when Mary is weeping and when Jesus himself is overcome with emotion, we see what lies at the heart of her confrontation with Jesus, her laying at his feet, this, this claiming that he would have been able to save Lazarus. They're all in grief. Grief is an integral part of the story. And I bring this up tonight because one of the things that many of us, not all of us, but many of us struggle with at times is naming our grief being willing to lay it at the feet of God, to name the things we've lost, the things that we wanted and never had, but so still feel like a loss, and to acknowledge to God that there is hurt and pain. It's not to say that we mourn and grieve as those without hope. Martha says that she knows Jesus is the Messiah. After he says, I'm the resurrection and the life, do you believe this? She says, you're the Messiah. Mar Mary comes out and acknowledges that Jesus would have had the power to save Lazarus. It reminds me of 1 Thessalonians where the apostle Paul says, we do not grieve as those without hope. Always our grief is bounded by, is set against the backdrop of the hope that we have in Jesus, but it is nonetheless grief. And being able to name grief is an important part of working with our grief and living into the hope that is ultimately the gift that we receive on the other side of our grief. And one of my worries sometimes, especially for the good Presbyterians I have been blessed to know and love, is we don't always feel the freedom to name our grief. And one of my invitations to you is we're not at the end, but as we near the end of the pandemic is to name the things that have given you grief. Not all of us have lost a loved one. Not all of us has had a particular dream die, but there are none of us who emerge from this pandemic without things that grieve us. And the truth about sadness and grief is this, we can either bring them out in healthy ways or they will come out on their own in unhealthy ways. And tonight, what I want to invite you to do is not so much a spiritual practice in the way we often think of them, but it's an invitation to a practice that is spiritual, that perhaps might be part of how you think about and name your grief before God as we approach the end of the pandemic. And it's the simple act of journaling, of taking time to write down our thoughts, our feelings, our hopes, our dreams, and I know when people think of journals, they think long prosaic sentences and reams and reams of paper and volumes of books. A journal doesn't have to be that complicated. One particular author who helps people through grief suggests that keeping a grief journal is as simple as every day or some period of time to simply write one or two sentences. And those sentences might be something as simple as Today, my grief feels like. Today, I'm surprised that I feel. Today, I am really missing. Today, I wish that. It may be that your entries might come at a time when you're particularly feeling the loss or you're willing to sit down and think through and to name the loss upon reflection. And maybe it's one sentence, maybe it's two, maybe it's four. Maybe it's these words, maybe it's your own, but name your losses, lift up your grief to God. We know from this story, this encounter with Jesus, Jesus 
wants to take our burdens. He invites us to share them. Our grief will never be so much that Jesus can't bear it. And we may find that over time that journal, that grief journal, may also begin to become a gratitude journal. Whereas we begin to find that there is less grief to name and more gratitude to claim. And it may be that that starts even from the beginning. It may be that the exercise of grieving reminds you of the things for which you are still thankful. But hopefully, prayerfully, if not at the beginning, by the end of this period of time that you set aside for grief journaling, you also find yourself doing gratitude journaling. But first, but first, naming the things that we have indeed lost. So I invite you before Robert takes us to some more song and to prayer to take a, a few moments right now and just in your mind, or maybe you're sitting at a keyboard, perhaps take that for, make that first entry. Today, my grief feels like, today I'm surprised that I feel. Today I'm really missing, today I wish that. Please join me in a time of silence, beginning that mental or real journaling, and then we will continue with our service. Friends, I invite you to join me in the responsive prayers of the people followed by the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray together. 
Holy God, we come before you in this Lenten season, wanting to draw nearer to you, but fearful of what we will lose if we do. Help us to trust in you. We know that following you can take us into uncomfortable places and require more of us than we want to give. Help us to trust in you. We read about the encounters of Jesus with disciples and friends, many who grieved and struggled, and you never left them alone. You were always there. Help us to trust in you. So guide us to the places where we need to be, where you will use our gifts and where we will be able to be best used by you for the blessing of the world. Help us to walk with you. Guide us as we serve, as we face loss, and as we rejoice in all that we gain in you. Help us to walk with you. Guide us to shine your light and share your love where it is most needed, where death and darkness and fear seem to have taken over and where your voice is hard to hear. Help us to walk with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear us as we pray in silence. And here I invite you to offer the prayers that are most on your hearts this night. And now we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will close this evening with the, the song, The Peace of the Earth. We'll sing it through twice. The peace of the earth be with you, the peace of the heavens too. Peace of the rivers be with you, the peace of the oceans too. as we continue our Lenten journey, approaching Palm Sunday and Holy Week, approaching the cross and the tomb and the empty tomb beyond. Remember that we do not journey alone. In our encounter with Jesus, we're reminded that Jesus is always with us, loving us, caring for us, providing for us, and that Jesus is the author and giver of life, the redeemer of life, the sustainer of life, and the one who holds us in life eternal. As you go into this night, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest with you 
and abide with you. May you know God's peace just as surely as God's peace is found in you. Share that with others and go in peace into this night. God bless you. Good night.